Okay, we're rolling. Right. Um, I guess first question is, is can you tell me a bit about your, your early career um, as a schoolboy, what sports you played, maybe who your heroes were? Uh, well, um, I didn't have um, a, a football background at all, really. Um, I came here as a little boy during the war to Blackpool. And uh, because of what it was, I came home one day with a gas mask and uh, with a label. And my mother, the next thing I knew, we were living in a boarding house in Blackpool, two floors up in one room where we lived for three years. And um, till my father came home after the war. And we stayed here. And my father rented a little grocer's shop. And uh, really, it was humble background, really, altogether. But we, um, I was fortunate in that um, I passed me 11 plus, and I went to a school, Arnold School, which was a good school, a direct grant school. And uh, there, I played rugby. Uh, I was a school athletics champion. Um, that's where I got interested in sport. Incredibly, in the same rugby 15 as me, our fly half was George Easton, who played for England at football. And in centre three quarters was Malcolm Phillips, who went on to play for England at rugby, and also became president of the rugby union. So it was quite, a, quite an athletic group I was with. Uh, but I used to play football on the beach with my friends and I had a habit of carrying a little tennis ball around with me, you know, playing with that. But it, um, I only became a footballer by accident because I did all levels and air levels. I got accepted at Liverpool University to read economics. And uh, it was while I was doing that that out of the blue, our PE teacher at um, the school said to me, would you fancy playing in a trial match at Bloomfield Road at Blackpool? But in those days, Blackpool were a big team, remember, in the 1950s, the days of Matthews and Mortensen. And I said, yeah, I'll play. So I went down to the training ground, to the Bloomfield Road, sorry, not to the training ground. And uh, the chap called Alec Munro, was in charge of supervising all the players coming in. He's a former player. And um, he said, what's your name? So I told him, he said, well, I haven't got your name on the list. So I said, oh, he said, have you brought your boots? I said, yeah. So he said, all right, sit down there. So I sat down. Anyway, he came up to me and he says, you play for the Whites. And I said, okay. He says, can you play on the wing? So I said, yes, you know. Anyway, cut a long story short, the team I played for won 4-1 and I scored all four, which was rather strange really in a way. Um, I think it was due to the inefficiency of the other defence rather than my ability. But nevertheless, that's how it began. And they asked me if I'd go back for training and I used to go at night time and, and it sort of went on from there. Because when uh, I left school, to go in the army because we all had to go in the army for two years I started to play football and I got a very quick promotion in Blackpool's team and uh, when I got in the army I was in the army team and the regimental team and it was when I was in the army doing national service that my career sort of took off because in the army team with me there would be Graham Shaw, Alan Hodgkinson, Trevor Smith, Duncan Edwards, Eddie Coleman, all people, Dave Dunmore, all went on to play for England. And we were all in the army team together. And I think I blossomed with them. Moving, when you came back to, to sign professional forms, um, can you tell me a bit about that and about your first team debut? Well, I, the first team debut actually came while I was in the army. I came on for leave at Christmas and I'd been playing in the reserves and um, it was on the Christmas day the Blackpool played Portsmouth at Blackpool and it was a draw and 
I was looking at Portsmouth and I thought, mm, good team these. It was the days of when they had England players at Portsmouth, Phillips and Froggart and Henderson and Dale. They had some good players, Johnny Harris. And um, I think they were near the top. And Blackpool were not doing very well. Anyway, the fullback got injured. Blackpool fullback Eddie Shinwell got injured. And so the boss, Joe Smith, sent for me, said, we'll take you down to um, play at Portsmouth on Boxing Day. It was, it was hard to believe, really, that was going to sort of happen, but I did, and that's where they was. And I made my debut there. And I always remember we arrived at Fratton Park at Portsmouth on Boxing Day. And when we arrived with the bus, mo most of the gates for the paying were all shut. The crowd were already inside. They'd all come to see Matthews, of course, and he wasn't fit to play. So uh, in the end, we... we we turned out with two or three reserves playing, and I was one of them. And in point of fact, Portsmouth scored, and I hadn't touched the ball. They scored after a minute or something, you know, and I hadn't touched the ball. So I had a difficult beginning, really. <laughs> <laughs> clearly got a lot better, very quickly. In terms of in terms of your early career, what, what are there any real standout moments from matches, from opponents, or indeed from, from players alongside? Well, I was, I've always sort of been, um, I started out, that I sort of fancied myself as a bit of a forward player really, as a, a winger, or at least as a, a right side midfield player. But it never blossomed. I mean, say so in 1958, we, we toured uh, to the Americas and Australia. And while I was there, uh, Matthews was with us, of course, and uh, but he got injured, and uh, so I had to play in one game, and I played on the right wing, and we beat, I think it was New South Wales, we beat them something like 5 nil or something, and I scored two or three, and I remember reading in the paper saying that Blackpool have got their ready replacement for Matthews, you know, but by that time I'd learned that I was not Stanley Matthews. Uh, and uh, never was anything like. And, but the fact that playing behind him taught me more than uh, it, I suddenly realised. I think uh, when you've got a very exceptional player like him in front of you, it makes a big difference. I've always found it, in some respects, you know, I always used to find it easier playing with England because you were playing with such good players. Mm -hmm. Everybody was a good player. And it was, you know, we're playing behind Matthews. People used to say, you know, he never wasted, Armfield never wasted a pass. All I was doing was giving the damn ball to him, you know. And then, and then he'll get on with it. And I was telling somebody the other day, we pl I remember us playing at Charlton on his 42nd birthday. And I was 21. And uh, I always remember it because it was, it was in the, picture was in the, I think it was the evening standard it was in those days. Same team, twice his age. And uh, we ran onto the field and uh, the crowd, I think the Blackpool fans started to sing happy birthday to you, you know, sort of thing. And the crowd picked it all up. All the crowd picked it up. Wow. That was an emotional moment really in football. I, couldn't th I can't think of another player that could happen to. You know, you can think of all the great players on an away ground, not at home, away from home, and they sang happy birthday to you, and for a minute, you know, he just sort of registered with me, you know. I'm playing with greatness here, you know. And now I'm the president of the Matthews Foundation. Yeah, so it's, it's and yeah, the family asked me if I'd do it, yeah. Because he was, he taught me about what it's like to really to be a professional footballer and what you should be aiming for and targets, you know, and so on. Don't be satisfied until you've played for England, you know. Which leads on really nicely to the next question. You, you touched on your uh, your England career. Um, how how did you first get called up? How how were you noticed? Well. I've been playing in the Young England, England team for three years, probably, three years. I'd had a fair um, 
bit of experience. Uh, I was it, in those days. It was the under twenty three team, <coughs> and uh, I think that's a much better register I do than under twenty one. But um, we were uh, pretty good. Uh, we didn't lose many. I was captain for the last two years, and we didn't lose many. We, you know, we were, we were pretty good over a season. And we went on a tour, and we went to Italy. Uh, Italy and Germany. And we played in the San Siro in Milan. And the Italian, there was a big crowd on, big crowd to watch you, you know. And we won 3 0. And Walter Winterbottom was with us, he was the England team manager. He's, after the game, we went back to the hotel and he said, I'm going to take you with me to Brazil and then to Peru, and then to Mexico, and then to USA. And I knew exactly what he meant, because the England team, that's where they were going. So I said, all oh, right, so I said, but well, you've got to go play Germany. You know, he says, no, he says, you're not going to Germany. You and Jimmy Greaves will come off. And Jimmy Greaves and I, the next day we got on the, oh, sorry, that night, we got, instead of going, Back to the back to the hotel and going to do a dinner, then moving on to play. In, I think it was in Berlin at the weekend. We got on the overnight train from Milan to Zurich on the sleeper, and uh, we picked up the Swiss airplane with Winterbottom, Jimmy Greaves, and myself. Picked up the England team at Heathrow, and we went on to Rio. And I played my first game in Rio there. Wow, what a, what a place to make your England, full England debut. Well it was, because uh, this was Brazil at their height, remember. They'd won the World Cup in 58, the days of Grincha and Pelly and all them. And, um, yeah, well it's, I think it's still, the, it, was the, it was the biggest recorded gate at a football match, I think it, when they played us, I think it was 150,000. We were a bit of a team, misfits is the wrong word, but you know, inexperienced players we had, international, because in 58 we lost four of our best players at Munich, in the main Munich air crash. You know, Roger Byrne, Tommy Taylor, Duncan Edwards, they were all, you know, players who were exceptionally good players. And replacing them wasn't easy. Um, and so it was left to people like me, you know, come in and try and do something about it. And we lost 2-0. I think the gate was 150,000. The noise level was unbelievable. Well, that's where it started. And, uh, but it was a real baptism, all right. It was hot, it's a hot day, but nevertheless, you know, kept your feet right back on the floor very quickly. Okay. Um, um, do you recall your first time playing at Wembley for England? Uh, yes, I played, the first time I actually played at Wembley was for the Young England team. And we played Romania. And that was the day when I, I discovered just how good Jimmy Greaves was. He, we were, it was a night game and uh, I used to play just sort of behind him, but on the same side of the field and I, I was quite a progressive fullback. I used to play, I used to like trying keeping the ball in there half. And uh, I used to look at Jimmy Greaves and I used to think, I, I, why do they keep opening up to let him run through? You know, that's how it looked. It looked to me as though they were just saying, well, you know, we'll all move over and let him run past us, you know. And what it was, he had this amazing ability. And one thing people never mention today when they talk about him as a goal scorer was this terrific pace he had. He, was, he wasn't a big man, but his legs were long, you know, and, and he, he got across the top of the ground so quickly. Of course, and he was two good feet as well. But that was, yeah, that was the, the thing I was remember. And oddly enough, on that first tour to South America, I went with the England team, he was my roommate. Oh, nice. Um, moving, moving up towards uh, 1966 on the mm -hmm. World Cup, um, 
what are your, your recollections of, of the sort of couple of years leading up towards it? <coughs> well, I've been captain for uh, like two years, mm -hmm. three years, nearly three, and uh, the worst thing was uh, in 64, the end of 64, last day of the season, I had my case with me, and Alf Ramsey was in the stand. We were playing at Ipswich, Blackpool. I was going, we were going down to London, then we were flying off to play in Rio, in the Little World Cup, it was called. And I'm right at the end of the game, I got a pain in me down here, groin. And um, most players will tell you it's one of the worst injuries. And um, instead of uh, going on to uh, Heathrow after the game, the doctor said to me, you need to have that seen to. So Alf Ramsey said, well, we're staying in London for 24 hours, you let me know what you like to me. And the doctor said, I finished up in Blackpool Hospital. And um, these days, it would, they would probably repair it in, I don't know, four, three or four weeks, you know, with an operation. And it took me three, four months to get back. So by that time, I'd, England had played and uh, I lost my place in the England team, you know, they had taken over. Uh, but I, because I had to sort of get myself back in motion again. And um, I started to do okay. And then come the end of 1965, uh, I was playing in London and Alf came to the match, Alf Ramsey, and he said, how are you doing? I said, I'm okay now, I'm quite good. He says, yeah, I've been watching. He says, you're looking quite good. He says, um, I'd like you to be fit for the World Cup. So I said, oh, good. So I might have been the first player ever to be told that he was going to play, you know. And um, so anyway, when, the, when he got round to forming the World Cup squad, he had, he had about 30 there, and I was one of the 22 when he named them all. and. So then we went on, we played Yugoslavia at Wembley and I was captain right back and I played well and we won. And then we went on to Finland and we won 3-0. I was captain again and uh, I know I played all right. But right at the end of the game, one of the Finnish players stood on me, left foot. Anyway, after the game, I got in the dressing room and I said to all the shepherds and I said, this is a bit sore. And I had x-ray and I just had a fine, frank little fracture down my little toe. So they told Alf and he said, well, what do we do? He says, mm, it took him a couple of weeks to get over that. And um, so there was another match or two before the final, I forget when it was. I think they played two matches in about four days or something. So I, I couldn't play in either of those. But by the time the first game came round in the World Cup, I, I think I could have played, you know. But by then he'd stuck to a back four that he'd gone with, you see. And quite right, because they'd done quite well, I thought. And in point of fact, you know, that didn't play again. So um, it was the injury that, uh, that did me. It was, uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, I went right through it. What was South like as a, as a manager? <laughs> different, different to anybody else. Um, I, I, had a, I had a soft spot for him, I liked him in a way because he was forthright. I was once playing in Scotland at Wembley and the ball came to me and I tried to, I was on the edge of the box and I tried to turn the ball away and I kicked it right into Jim Baxter's legs and it ran past me. I cut a long story short, they scored. And Alf came up to me after the game and I looked at him and he looked at me he says, do you know, I said, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I'm sorry, I know. He says, you won't do that again, will you? I says, no, no, he says, I mean, you won't do it again. And I didn't know whether he meant, well, you won't be playing for us anymore, or, but he, what he, he said to me on the training ground after is, on the edge of the box, when there's any, any doubt, he said, you know, you do have to put your foot through the ball. So from that moment on, every time the ball came to me there, I used to get my left foot and wild it away. In terms of in terms of sixty six and, and the mood in the country leading up to the tournament, 
What, what's the what the excitement? Oh, yeah. Nowadays, it'd just be all over the media, wouldn't it? Well, it is. Television wasn't as uh, like it is now. I mean, television is running the country now. Well, it wasn't then. And, uh, you know, it's... It was it was a different world, in a way, um, but the uh, there was still a little bit of outpouring from the war. I would have thought, and um, I mean not any not animosity, but you know there was still a bit of, you know most of us had grown up during the war. The players had certainly. We were all children of the war. Um, people. You know, refuted that, but I've always felt it. We knew what it was like to do without food and to do, you know, uh, to be rationed and no street lighting for five years, and you know, and I think it may gave us an, an inner toughness, and there was a will to do well for the country. There weren't many agents involved or things like that. What? Um in, in terms of, of the group matches, anything particularly stand out in your mind? Well, I just thought we didn't play well. Right. Um, in the, I knew the first match we played Uruguay first. I knew that'd be difficult. Those of us who've been to South America know, never underestimate South American teams because you never know what they're capable of. But since then, they've had trouble with Uruguay, haven't they? You know, yes. Yes. Uh, always difficult to beat teams like that. Anyway, we fiddled around with that, and of course Alf started off with wingers. He had John Conley playing, Terry Payne playing, Ian Callaghan playing. You know, so his intent was to three, you know, wingers, and of course his team became a wingless wonders almost. But it just shows really, you know, he had the the wherewithal to make changes when he felt it was needed. And he did well, really, from that point of view. But then I thought we played France were a bit better, uh, a little bit more in it. I think the turning point for the whole thing, really, to me, came when Bobby Charlton smacked a goal in against Mexico. Uh, Mexico weren't too bad. Um, but we, we were doing all right. But Bobby Charlton... I felt he was the key player in the World Cup. Um, in the World Cup final, I always thought it was Alan Ball, but in the in the, in the the build up to it, I thought Bobby was the the player that turned. You know, when we played Portugal, I couldn't see them beating us. Not here, not at here. You know. And I think they had a bit of a fear of Bobby Charlton, as I think Germany had, which Beckenbauer proved later, you know, in 1980. Um, I think it's, sorry, 1970, I should say. But I think the thing is that one moment sometimes can, can spring something. Uh, one moment in a match, I mean, see, on Saturday I, w I went to, I was at Everton. Uh, we're doing the commentary on Everton, playing uh, against Chelsea. And it was nil-nil, and it wasn't really going anywhere. Anybody could do it. And then the car court scores a goal out of nothing. And it really was a terrific goal. But I wouldn't have believed he could have got past three Chelsea players like that. But that changed the atmosphere in the ground, changed everything. And I think you get that in football. And I think England's determining moment was that goal of Bobby Charlton's against Mexico. From that point, I think we always thought we could win. And um, I think Al's other strong point was when he put Jeff Hurst back um, against Argentina because that was in the quarterfinal. Because Argentina, they're another, they're another Uruguay. And uh, they were in those days, not now. You know, there was uh, no no Messi playing around then. You know, they, they, this was a team who meant business, and we beat them. Th um, 
as we'd beaten them in 62 as well. We put them out in, in South America, in Chile, when I was playing. And, but I think the thing was that we, with Jeff Hurst coming back, it gave us another outlet, a bit of height as well, a bit of strength. And Jeff was doing well at the time, and he was a better ball player than people gave him credit for. And from that point, I always thought we had a real chance. I was never frightened, funny enough, never frightened of Portugal and Eusebio, funny enough. And I always thought, you know, once we got to the semi-final, I thought we'd do it. What are your recollections of, of World Cup final day, sort of from, from the morning onwards? Well, it was around the hotel in the morning. We were all tense and waiting for things to happen. And, you know, everybody's trying to be talkers or they're relaxed, you know, and they're not. But uh, for those of us who didn't play, remember there was no subs. Um, we had a seat in the stand just behind the rail box and uh, Al said to me, you know, what we want you to do is bring the players down. Because I was like what you might call a captain of the, the lads who didn't play. And um, I was one of the senior players and bring the lads down, we come down in the left, and at the end of the match, I want everybody together. So I said, okay, which we did. And in point of fact, when we came down, uh, England were winning 2-1. And as I came to sit down, they, the German equalised. So I still to this day don't believe some of the lads who were behind me saw that goal live. I don't think they could have done. But um, then I sat right behind half and uh, we watched it through to the end. I always thought, you know, somehow I just couldn't see us losing. I don't know what it was. I just couldn't, you know, Germany were good. They always are well disciplined to organize. But it was a, it was a taxing day, you know. Pitch, pitch was a bit soft, there'd been a bit of rain. Sun came out, went away, came out, went away. You know, it was one of those days. But uh, at the end of the match, I was really thrilled. I was really thrilled, you know. People have said to me, don't you wish you'd been playing? Of course I wish I'd been playing. Uh, but from that, that apart, you know, we've, since then, every year we have a get together. And um, I don't know whether this might be the last this time, 50 years, I don't know. But um, I think looking back, most of them have turned up, you know, with one or two are no longer with us or not well enough. But with, there's always been at least 12, 14 of us, you know. And it, it's, uh, it's, we've never, we've never, we could have had it sponsored, we could have had everything, we've never done that. We've always paid our way and, 